it's not the case that people are stuck in party identities. There are a lot of Americans who are going to vote this year for a party they did not vote for 10 years ago. That kind of change is happening. The trouble is it's happening in a way that remains bifurcated, that remains at at 50-50, in part because the big question is really a yes or no question rather than a question about the future, about the range of issues that might shape people's lives. And I think in that sense, both parties are failing to offer a political vision that might foster a coalition. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Welcome to a special election episode of The Good Fight, with only a few weeks left until the U.S. presidential election. I thought that I would invite some of the most insightful past guests of The Good Fight to give us an update on the race and to answer a question that's been bugging me, which is why do American elections keep turning out to be so tight? Why in this particular period of American history, but not in many other periods, do we end up with these really close run results? So today I had on Yuval Levin, who is a senior fellow as well as the director of social, cultural and constitutional studies at AEI, as well as the author of many insightful books, including most recently American Covenant, how the constitution unified our nation and could again. And Rui Tixera. Rui is the person who came up with the idea of a sort of rising demographic majority, uh, who also has been one of the most insightful critics of that idea. And he is the author most recently of the excellent Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. And much of our conversation is based on a really excellent report that the two of them have co-authored for AI called Politics Without Winners. Can either party build a majority coalition? A report which poses the question of what it would take for either Democrats or Republicans to break through the partisan gridlock and the close-run elections of the last few times. I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you also want access to future bonus episodes of the podcast, as well as the bonus material I include in the conversations every week with major thinkers from around the world, please go now to yashamonk.substack.com and become a paying subscriber. That's yashamonk.substack.com. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Ruined Yuval, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much. So look, I've been asked a question incessantly during interviews in various places in Europe uh, for the last weeks, and I never have a good answer to this, so I'm going to pose it to the two of you. Who's winning the race? You know, there's uh, many views on this, but I think the most correct view is it's like a (laughs) toss-up. I mean, it really is that close. For example, if you look at uh, Nate Silver's forecasting model today, um, which I think is probably the best of the lot for whatever much you think those things are worth. He's got it 5149 Harris Trump in terms of probability. And the rest of the models aren't too far off that. So when you're in that territory, even if it was 5545, it really is just a coin toss. There's so many other factors here. We don't know what kind of bias is built into the polls at this point. There are various known unknowns. So the fairest thing to say at this point is it is a toss up. Now, In the very recent past, say the last week or 10 days, there's probably been a slight movement toward Trump. So in other words, Harris's momentum may have stalled a little bit, and that could have something to do with we're now getting relatively far away from the last sort of shocks to the race that were beneficial to to Harris, the last of which was the debate. So that's what I think. What do you think, Yuval? You think that's uh, fair? I I agree with that. And I think it's always the hardest thing for people to accept. You know, I talk to people who are not uh, in and around politics and they always think, uh, you know, like we know something they don't know and what's really going on. And what's really going on is a 50-50 race. And maybe one outcome is a little more plausible than the other. And that flips around a little bit. But that doesn't actually mean that that's the outcome we'll end up with. And where we go here is about 50-50. It's a very hard thing to accept, but it's actually... 
where we've been for a long time in a lot of elections, so we should get used to it. That's right. Politics without winners, to coin a phrase. You know, it might be worth pointing out some of the demographic contours of this stalemate at this point, which is that we're seeing a continuation in this cycle of declining democratic support among working class voters, i.e. non-college voters, including non-whites. Um, that definitely appears to be happening, and we're seeing an improved performance among college-educated voters, particularly white college-educated voters. So in a way, those are two forces going in two different directions, but they're kind of netting out at pretty close to 50-50. So that's something to keep an eye on, how those two trends are, are working themselves out, and in the end, we'll probably determine who wins the election. We said this at one point in our paper, there's a lot of churn underneath the hood of these coalitions, but amazingly, they seem to all want, they seem to wind up basically continuing to butt heads at roughly a 50-50 place. Uh, thanks, guys. That's about as unsatisfying an answer as I give to all the people who ask me the question. Um, great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> and great minds uh, hopefully uh, uh, know what they don't know, which is uh, true for all of us relative to the outcome of the election. Um, here's, a, here's a way of posing the question, right? On one count, this should be easy, right? Donald Trump is a one-term president who lost his bid for re-election. He is believed by most Americans to bear significant responsibility for an assault on the U.S. Capitol. He is at this point gearing up to be the oldest or one of the oldest uh, presidents in United States history. He is very unpopular in the electorate with you know, approval ratings that are under the water, even though they're slightly better than they used to be at various points. Uh, he no longer has a, a, a big, exciting vision for the country that in the minds of not me, but many Americans he did have in 2016 when he was making these grand promises about everything he'll transform. In this electoral cycle, it feels like his campaign is mostly about himself and, and, and seeking vengeance for the people who have gone after him in his mind and so on and so forth. Shouldn't this be an easy election for Democrats to win? Um, and if so, why are they not winning it? You know, you describe that as though he were the incumbent, but he's not the incumbent. And in a time when the incumbent is unpopular and the incumbent party is unpopular, that party is running a candidate that, uh, while certainly more impressive to the public than the actual incumbent president, is not very impressive to the public. And that candidate just has trouble overcoming doubts about uh, incumbency and the present. And so... I, I think that the peculiar challenge that both parties face is that their greatest strength is not being one another, and their greatest weakness is being themselves, and they can't really change either of those things. Um, so I think the question is whether the, the problem of incumbency that Kamala Harris has to bear can be a slightly lesser problem than the problem of being Donald Trump that Donald Trump has to bear. And in a funny way, that's what this election comes down to. I think it suggests that on the whole, Republicans as a group are in a better place than Democrats as a group. But they're running an extremely unpopular, their candidate is an extremely unpopular figure. That's a slightly better place to be as a party, but he is their candidate. And I think we're at 50-50, not because people love both parties equally, but because people can't uh, decide which they dislike more. Yeah, another way of looking at this would be given the situation of the incumbent party, the incumbent president, people's views of the economy and the current situation, the direction of change in the country, you know, why isn't Trump ahead by five or seven points, right? And I think there's the answer then is, you know, he he's a weakness for the ticket and the party itself is not that popular. So he's, you know, they're not in that great shape either. But in a way, that just underscores the, the fundamental answer to this question. When you have two weak and beleaguered parties going at each other, the reason they can't decisively beat the other is because they actually have real fundamental problems as a party in terms of their brand, their image, their practices, the, the policies they're identified with that make them unattractive to half the country. And they're not really working very hard to make <laughs> make them attractive in a positive sense to a, to a much broader majority. So that's why we have a situation where despite the obvious weaknesses of the Democrats, despite the obvious weaknesses of the Republicans and Trump, nobody has a decisive upper hand. So I think there's two slightly different readings of what makes this election close and in a way two slightly different readings of what you've been saying, and perhaps both are true. One is structural. It is to say that 
The economy is pretty good, but it's not amazing. Trump is unpopular, but so is the Democratic Party incumbent. Um, you know, there's just a bunch of broader structural factors that make this an, ele an election that should be reasonably close. And when you look at it, like some political scientists do with basic models that take things like the inflation rate and the employment rate and a bunch of other kinds of factors, they predict a relatively close election. And lo and behold, the election is relatively close. The other way of reading this, which obviously speaks to the report that you've just published, is to say, uh, no, despite these structural factors, one of these two parties could actually be winning big. And the failing to win big because neither of the parties has figured out how to broaden its appeal beyond the core part of the electorate, you know, on which it can rely, which can mobilize to to the polls. So is this more about just structurally the election was always going to be close? Or, or, or do you think, to start with the Democrats, they could have done something to win this election big? What would it have taken for Democrats to win big in this election? And then uh, I can ask you the same question about Republicans in a moment. Well, I mean, that's always a difficult question to answer in the sense we're talking about rerunning history. But, uh, you know, I think there was a couple of things that uh, were should have been clear to the Democrats when they got into office in 2021, which is that Biden did not have a mandate. He barely got in there. He barely controlled the Senate. They, people were not voting for a transformative precedent. They were voting for normalcy. They were voting for an end to the COVID pandemic and get the economy back on track. And let, you know, let's just turn down the volume here on, on politics. Now, the way Biden actually governed, reflecting the compromises he made during his campaign and the way he staffed up once he was elected, really did empower the left of the party to a non-trivial extent. And, you know, that reflected a lot of the movement within the party and within the so-called discourse overall that took place in the George Floyd summer of 2020. There was a distinct and has been a distinct move to the left on the part of Democrats on issues, race and gender, crime and immigration uh, and so on. And Biden did not come in determined to do much about that. In fact, one of the very first things he did is get rid of the Trump rules that were uh, sort of being at least somewhat effective in keeping illegal immigration done, down. And by George, you know, we got a lot of illegal immigration. So that happened. Uh, so the, dis, the, 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 the inability of Democrats to disidentify themselves with the unpopular aspects of their policies or of their image has definitely been a factor. I think related to that, because they viewed themselves as being a transformative party in a transformative election, they actually had a very aggressive approach to legislating in the early parts of the Biden administration, which was really not justified by the situation or by the amount of support they had. I mean, who can, who can forget the endless arguments about how many trillions of dollars should go into Build Back Better? Uh, when the country was still, in a sense, reeling and trying to recover from the previous period of time. And then in the end, related to that, though not obviously just caused by that, we did have very significant spike in inflation that really did crimp people's living standards, really did make people think that this was a, uh, you know, this was not a good situation, that they had elected Biden and the Democrats to return things to normal. They weren't normal. That was bad. Now, the economy has continued to, has improved since then, obviously. Inflation's gone down. Real wages finally started to go back up. But I think that the shock of that is still in people's system, particularly working class people, because they actually look back at the first few years, the years of the Trump administration before COVID hit as being pretty good. Wages were up. Incomes were up. And there was very low inflation. It was great. <laughs> and they don't feel that way about how great things have been for the Democrats. So under the Democrats. So those two things together, a sort of c continued commitment to cultural leftism that was not popular with most voters, particularly working class voters, and a sort of identification with a, you know, sort of pull out all the stops, legislative uh, and policy style that just didn't fit with the moment and did for whatever, you know, better or worse, become identified with some things people really didn't like. These were things that hurt the Democrats. So, you know, arguably, if you had gotten at that time, you really should have stuck to what you had a mandate for, normalcy. You know, get the economy back working, don't do anything that might cause a lot of inflation, um, get the COVID thing under control, you know, sort of move to the center on cultural issues and reassure people that we're just all normal here in the Biden administration. They didn't do that. And as a result, 
you know, here we are, or partly as a result. I think there's also a broader pattern here that uh, aligns very much with what Ray's talking about, but that broadens the picture a bit. Because in thinking about why we're at 50-50 in this election, I, I, I run into a pattern that I encountered in thinking about the question of loss of confidence in institutions in my work over the last 10 years, which is you can explain the public's loss of confidence in any particular institution in a relatively straightforward way. There are reasons, right? We can come up with, 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 with causes why people might not trust the, the military right now or why they might not trust uh, public health officials after the pandemic. But when you step back and see that nobody trusts anything, then it, it seems like there's more to explain here. And so when you step back and see that we've had 50-50 elections for 30 years, and really, I think the only, the only real exception might have been 2008, when Barack Obama, I think, won a pretty comfortable majority. Uh, just about nobody else has been able to pull off a real win. And the answer to that is not the economy in one particular moment or another, though that obviously is a factor in these elections, but I think has to do with the way in which both parties are thinking about how to gain power and how to use power. And what you find is exactly the pattern that Rui describes here, which is, after the parties win, they think, first of all, that they've won a durable majority, and second, that that means it's time to satisfy their base. And those things are both wrong. The, the, the way to build a broader coalition is actually to use political power to broaden your appeal, rather than to use political power to service your base. And the, ultimately, you have to see that close elections means that you need to use political power to broaden your appeal. So being in office should be the time when you show the country that in the next election they should trust you because you do broadly acceptable, moderate things that work. And instead, both parties win these narrow elections and they say, well, now we've got to get everything we're, we've ever wanted because we're going to lose this thing in five minutes. And therefore they do. And I think this basic misjudgment about how do we get power and what should we do with it, in other words, a, a loss of a sense of how to do their core work is behind a lot of why every election now seems to work like this and why neither party is willing to learn anything when it loses an election, as they both have done in some significant ways in the 21st century. And then they just turn around and try again to get 50% plus one and then pretend that that means they've won a big election. I will tell you, if Donald Trump wins this election, his supporters will say, this is the dawn of a new age that will be dominated by the Trump coalition. And if Kamala Harris wins, they will say, finally, the new era of the, uh, of the coalition of, 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 the, of the minority of majorities or whatever they end up calling it, now the left is dominant. And each party refuses to see that to win, you have to win the broad middle. And that means you have to show them that you're trustworthy after you win, when you have power. They've both sort of forgotten. I mean, it's, it just seems like basic malpractice here in a two-party system. But both parties now do it every time. There's sort of two possible reasons for that, right? I mean, one is that neither party has been able to capture the imagination of 55 plus, perhaps 60 percent of Americans in the way that in some past eras people did. And we, I, I'm going to come back to that when we really go into the report that you just published. But another more tactical reason for that, and I don't know where the cart is and where the horse is here, is that the bases of a party, the party activists, the party donors just seem to have much more control over the direction of a party when we did at other points, right? I mean, why is it that when these parties win an election, they don't try to build this broader coalition, perhaps because they lack the imagination for what that broader coalition might look like, but also because in the Democratic Party, you know, the highly educated college graduates who live in the coastal areas and have moral and political views that are quite distant from the average voter and even the average member of their own coalition just have hugely outsized power. 
And in the Republican Party, even though there's some amount of change within the party and there's some moves towards trying to make it the kind of party of multiracial working class, when it comes to making economic policy in the end, some of the sort of big business interests and so on remain very powerful and they're able to get a lot of what they want passed through Congress. And so Republicans don't uh, broaden the coalition the kind of way they might. So sort of, you know, is, is this just a problem of these party activists and elites having having too much power? Is, is that sort of a structural change that has happened? Or, or is it really about the sort of lack of imagination and the incoherent program of each party? Well, I think the two things are related, right? I mean, I think that, in fact, the activists and the, the sort of shadow parties of both parties have an enormous amount of power. And we have a sort of a media and, and general political ecosystem now, which enhances the power of these, of these uh, non- directly political actors so that they can actually bring to bear a lot of influence through lobbying, through adv advocacy groups, through a variety of other means, through the media, through, you know, various sort of targeted uh, sort of megaphones almost that, that yell at the party activists and mobilize them. It's a different universe than it was 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And you can definitely see it in the Democratic Party where, um, you know, the shadow party that John Judas and I described in our book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone, really is enormously powerful and really is different. You know, that's key, right? I mean, it'd be one thing if they were powerful and they were tuned into the beating heart of America and they were just trying to push the party to be do more outreach and be more aggressive and so on. But no, they have their own set of priorities, their own values, the things they really care about. They're going to push them no matter what. They're not necessarily uh, committed to the idea that the party should win a broad majority. They do want the party to win, but the broad majority thing is less important. And mostly they just want to see their, their, uh, their priorities attended to. And I think somewhat is that is true on the Republican side as well. Whereas despite the fact that you know it's become a more working class party i think the people in control really in control of the discourse within and around the republican party and republican media at least establishment media are still kind of singing out of the same hymn book they have for a while despite the fact that their base has changed the people they have to respond to has changed and things you know it's just a different world they can't figure out how to leverage that growing working class support into that broad majority that conceivably could be could be built on that. Is, is that fair, Yuval? Yeah, I think the Republican story feels a little different because the internal arguments are less about policy, or at least on the surface they are, than they are on the Democratic side. There is a kind of struggle about who will own anti-leftism. The, the Republican Party is now, above all, an anti-left party. It understands itself to be the outside party in American life, the the party that's being pushed around by various kinds of elites and its leaders are always at risk of being attacked as either being weak or being corrupted by the appeal of elite power and that means that coalition building itself becomes risky in republican politics that seeming like you're reaching too far beyond the angry base of the party runs the risk of making you look like you are trying to water down the the direction that primary voters want to go in. And the striking thing about this is that it generally has very little to do with substantive policy debates. A lot of it is about tone. A lot of it is about a kind of willingness or unwillingness to negotiate. And you really see this in the in the congressional party, where House Republicans right now are not really trying to do anything in particular most of the time. They don't have some agenda that they're really trying hard to push. Their, their fight of the day with the left, as it's expressed on cable news and social media, is what occupies all of them. And that makes it very, very difficult to think about building a broader coalition than the existing base of the party. Um, obviously, Trump himself and Trumpism has a lot to do with why things have taken this shape. There's one big question at the heart of the life of the Republican Party now, and the question is Donald Trump. And obviously, most Republicans answer yes. A few Republicans answer yes, but. Some will answer no. But none of them are talking about anything else. And I think that does make it very difficult to offer the public very much that's of interest to people who are not already in this conversation. 
Yeah, I mean, analogously, though, I think the Democrats are in the thrall of something pretty similar to that, too. They're now the anti-right party, the anti-Trump party. You know, it binds us all together. We, we band of brothers and sisters is that we hate Trump. We hate the Republican Party. And, you know, we're, we're like the clock is ticking. We're three seconds to fascism. So we've all got to stand up and be counted, converse, and which definitely promotes a sense that if you're trying to think about how to broaden the coalition by making compromises on various controversial issues and, you know, sort of allowing us how some of the criticisms of the Democratic Party might have a point, that is anathema, right? That is basically what I call the Fox News fallacy drives a lot of this. If something is being mentioned by conservatives, if a critique is being made by Fox News, if people are arguing illegal immigration is a big problem, um, crime is a big problem, Maybe, in fact, there are just two biological sexes, whatever. I mean, there's a, a lot of things you could pick on to, to argue with the Democrats at this point. Um, or maybe we're, we're going too far in the direction of, you know, sort of basing our economic program around fighting climate change. And maybe cheap energy is actually like really important. All of these things are, are cast into the darkness by most Democrats at this point, because they really are. Those are just, you know, how many times have I heard this? Those are just Fox News talking points. Well, the fact they're Fox News talking points doesn't mean they're completely wrong. They're probably talking about them for a reason. These are concerns of voters. These are problems. If you basically organize your party around opposing the other party and demonizing it, even if, <laughs> I grant you, Donald Trump is, you know, if you're going to demonize anybody, I suppose he's a good candidate. But it's just not... It does not lend itself to coalition building, to purposive coalition building, which is really what Yuval and I keep on coming back to in our report. You know, you cannot build this kind of broad coalition that I think is going to be most effective without purposely trying to do it. You know, that has to be your goal. You have to be thinking about it all the time. You can't just be thinking about how you're going to smash the other party. So we've been dancing around the report for a little while. Let's actually go into it directly. One of the kind of unstated assumptions of this conversation has been that there is a broad majority for the taking, that either Democrats or Republicans could find a way to really dominate a political era, 25, 30 years of American politics, in which they wouldn't win 80-20 and they wouldn't win every election bit, in which they clearly would be dominant in the kind of way that notably no political party has been dominant for the last 30 years. Now, one answer that people might give to that is to say, well, why should we think that that is likely or possible? Aren't our political parties so polarized that everybody just votes on the same side all the time? And isn't it true that uh, there's no longer any swing voters and nobody's changing their mind anyway? So I'd love to hear your argument. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to agree with it, but I'd love to hear your argument for why that assumption I is wrong. And I take it you think that's something to do with history as well, right? Your report in a, in a really nice and convincing way lays out the past periods in which there has been this kind of political uh, dominance. So sort of what is the argument for the, for the idea that the normal mode of American history has been to have one party build a dominant coalition that persists for a surprisingly long time before it breaks down and there's a realignment and it sort of has to be reconstituted? And why should we think that under changed circumstances, that's still the case? Why should we think that we haven't somehow changed from that historical trajectory and what was possible in the past somehow isn't possible again anymore today? So I think maybe the, the place to start is with a bit of history, which is simply that if you look in on American politics at just about any time in our history, what you would find is a recognizable majority and minority coalition. Uh, fairly durable. They tend to last for multiple election cycles, often decades at a time. And in a sense, the differences between them are organized around some core set of issues in American politics that do render the public into a majority and minority coalition. And then as things change, and the parties try both to – the majority tries to hang together a very complex coalition. The minority tries to broaden its coalition. And you, you run into one or several transformative elections that allow the minority to become a durable majority for a time. That's been the pattern of American history. Periods like the ones we're living in are very exceptional. There's really been only one like it. It was at the end of the 19th century. It lasted for about 20 years, and we've already been living through a longer one. Now, I think it's important for this purpose to distinguish polarization from something more like this kind of deadlock that we're living through. 
Polarization is more common than that. The two parties really hating each other, that's not always the case, but it is often the case in a two-party system. And polarization is not the same as the sort of 50-50 politics that we're living with here. And in a sense, the 50-50 the, the, the politics we're living with, in my view, it has a lot to do, for one thing, with a sort of confusion about the, the issues that ought to be the governing issues in the post-Cold War era in America. The Cold War ended now a long time ago, and we're still really struggling to think through what are the big questions about the direction of the American economy, about the direction of American foreign policy, the culture, some very basic questions are still unsettled after a very long stretch. And those are the kinds of questions that normally divide our parties. Our report is based in part on a, on a large survey that the, the American Enterprise Institute's um, survey center performed for us. And one of the striking things about it is that among the issues that the public does not identify with one party or another, or where there's not an obvious advantage right now for one party or another, among those are the economy and foreign policy, which are really the two biggest issues in American politics, at least by definition. Those are the two big issues that our national government was intended uh, to address. And it seems like neither party really offers a vision on those issues right now. They're not identifiable along that axis. And they're failing, in a sense, to show the public what it would mean to vote for the Democrats, to vote for the Republicans, other than to say what it would mean is the other people wouldn't win. And I think in that sense, there is a failure here to appeal to the imagination of the public. It's not the case that people are stuck in party identities. There are a lot of Americans who are going to vote this year for a party they did not vote for 10 years ago. That kind of change is happening. The trouble is it's happening in a way that remains bifurcated, that remains at 50-50, in part because the big question is really a yes or no question rather than a question about the future, about the range of issues that might shape people's lives. And I think in that sense, both parties are failing to offer a political vision that might foster a coalition. Yeah, I mean, the idea that, you know, there are no swing voters or no persuadables for just polarized and will be endlessly so, I think is a really lazy approach to the issue that I think really some political partisans are definitely uh, prey to. It's like, what, what can we do? It's a great excuse, right? If you think that there's no swing voters, then there's no need to convince anybody. You can just play the greatest hit, appeal to the base, make no ideological trade-offs. It so happens that the policy you want to pass anyway also happens to be the one that mobilizes the most people. And so it's a very con ideologically convenient belief. It reduces cognitive dissonance and gives activists an excuse to, to stick with hardline policies that come at some real electoral cost while pretending that there is no electoral cost, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's comfortable for them in that sense, because it just means let's press the accelerator and keep on going in the direction uh, we were going. Let's not make any compromises. Let's not uh, have any uncomfortable thoughts. I think it, it really is a tonic for, for those people, activists on both sides. The, you know, why worry about trying to persuade those persuadables? They're not really persuadable anyway. The important thing is to get our people out to vote. And obviously, that's a recipe for continued 50-50 politics and not building a broad majority. But it's fundamentally wrong, I think. If you look at, you know, again, referring to the survey that, that you've all uh, alluded to, I mean, and lots of other data, it's very clear Americans are cross-pressured in all kinds of issues. There's all kinds of things that are unpopular in both parties that both parties seem to be committed to, which could conceivably be changed. There's a path for a more moderate approach on immigration, a more moderate approach on crime. You know, and then if you're talking about a different economic vision, well, okay, you've got to figure out how to sell that. You know, the Republicans obviously are at sixes and sevens trying to figure out what their economic vision now and how to deal with sort of this populist upsurge and sort of the decline of more orthodox Reaganomics and sort of seeking a, a new way forward. And Democrats, they may think they've got it solved, but I think people really don't don't get it. They don't really think that Democrats have a sense of how to produce prosperity for the country in a, in a consistent way. They know the Democrats want to spend money. They know Democrats care about the climate. 
But how does that translate into the lives of working class people? How do you persuade them? Because they really are where the persuadables are fundamentally concentrated and where the discontent for the Democrats is most severe. You can get affluent college educated professional to continue voting for you regardless of whether they have a clue about what to do with the economy because they're on your side culturally. They, that's how they cast their vote. But if you're going to reach uh, you know, more median American voter, median working class voter, you have to figure out how to convince them that you have a way forward on these really big issues. We call them jump balls in our, in our report. And then that's really, that's kind of the big game of this you know, coalition broadening dynamic that we, we think uh, you know, should, be, should be more of a big deal these days. You know, figure out how to sell yourself on those big questions and figure out how to reduce your vulnerabilities on the things that are at least somewhat secondary, but always keeping in mind that what you want to do is in fact reach the persuadable voters and, you know, build it out from the middle and, and so on and so forth. It doesn't seem like it's that complicated. But I think one thing that gets in the way, Yasha, is what you're talking about, where, you know, sort of there's this mantra about, oh, we're just so polarized. Oh, anyone who votes for the other side is, you know, a tool of Satan. And, you know, they're just, they're not good people. We're the good people. We just had to get the good people out to vote. And I think that's a, that's a real tragedy in terms of, uh, you know, the quality of our politics and certainly gets in the way of building a broader coalition. So the argument here is that in most periods of American history, you have had a dominant coalition, one party being able to construct this really dominant coalition of people who could then win a number of elections in a row. And you might think that perhaps we are so polarized in a rigid way today but that's no longer possible because the country is split 50-50 and nobody ever changes their mind. But in fact, we've seen people change their mind quite a lot, even during this period of political stasis. It's not exactly the same people opposing each other 20 years ago and 10 years ago and today. Some of the demographic markers that would have uh, allowed you to predict the election quite well 10 or 20 years ago have really declined in significance. That's true of uh, being Hispanic, for example. Other demographic markers uh, that weren't so relevant 10 or 20 years ago or that might have pointed in the other direction have now become very important. Things like having a college degree, for example. And so actually we, we see that many people have changed their mind over the course of these years. It's just that, you know, there's been enough people changing their mind in opposite directions that each election has turned out to be close. I mean, one sort of less polite way of putting this point, uh, picking up on what both of you have been saying, is that each party has been so shit that the other party was able to get away with being equally shit. So I really uh, admired your report for that historical insight. And it really sort of walks us through the different shifting coalitions at different times in a way that is both very readable and engaging and quite far and, 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 and helped me think through this issue. The other thing you do, as you've uh, alluded to a couple of times, is a big survey where you look at a bunch of the issues that turn out not to be 50-50 issues, but 70-30 issues, sometimes 80-20 issues, and yet ones where each party on some of these counts is on the wrong side of it. So what is the set of majority beliefs that would stand at the core of a 60-40 you know, coalition in America? What is the set of values, attitudes, policies that are so broadly popular that if one of the political parties actually managed consistently to put them at the heart of their program, they would be able to have this kind of stable majority. You know, one way to think about this is that for, for all of my lifetime, I've heard people say that the underserved center of the country is uh, economically conservative and socially liberal. And what we find is roughly the opposite of that. Um, the, the, the core of what would need to be a durable majority coalition is relatively conservative or at least moderate on social issues relative to today's Democratic Party. It's quite conservative on social issues, but is also interested in an active government that spends money on behalf of the public and that's uh, where economic policy is, I think, well to the left of where the Republican Party has generally wanted to be in my lifetime. So that the underserved middle is, broadly speaking, more socially conservative than the Democrats, more economically liberal than the Republicans. And both parties have had some trouble reaching that center. I think they can both see that there are opportunities there, 
but they both have had trouble letting go of the priorities of their own base in a way that neither feels to the public, to the winnable public, like they're really reaching for that combination. And I think the set of issues that present themselves there are uncomfortable for both parties. They, they would take real sacrifice for the base of both parties to be able to make the kinds of arguments you'd need to make. But that's really where the center is. And a lot of elites in both parties are mo most comfortable with the opposite of that, with a mirror image of that. And obviously that's a big part of why the parties have had such trouble reaching these voters. There's a lot of issues where this is just so, so clear, the, the kind of dynamic that Yasha is talking about. From the standpoint of the Democrats, if you look at our survey and a lot of other data, you can see that, for example, in immigration, people are, people like immigrants. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they think they're great, but they don't want an uncontrolled border. They don't want a lot of illegal immigration. They actually think illegal immigration is, well, illegal. And, you know, that's just a very different than the attitude of Democrats and Democratic activists. And it was really an unbelievable, sort of in a way, unforced error that the Democrats come into office in 2021 and they basically open the floodgates because they're under such pressure from their advocacy groups to re undo everything Donald Trump did that they just sort of like, you know, they just made it open season. Anybody could get in, basically, and people knew it. And the famous New York Times article describing people making the journey to the border, you know, the, the final word or something was, and they think that once they get in there, they can stay forever. And they're not wrong. So this is like a terrible look. I mean, people like immigration. They have nothing against immigrants. They realize immigration is part of the history of the country. But they, they don't want the border basically out of control, and they don't want... You know, their, their, their communities overburdened and so on and so forth. I mean, these are all legitimate concerns. And the Democrats, there was a middle way on this, which they just did not take. Now they're trying to take it, but it's to some extent a little bit, you know, too little, too late. And, and what's striking about this particular point is that Democrats, I think, always feel very much under pressure from their interest groups. And it's not just because, uh, for historical reasons, interest groups have always had this strong standing in the Democratic Party. It's also, I think, that they mistake the views of the interest groups for a genuine representation of what the demographics in whose name these interest groups speak actually believe. You know, one of the really astonishing lines in your report is based not on your own survey, but a CBS News survey from June, in which it turns out that not only 62% of all voters believe that starting a new national program to deport all undocumented immigrants currently living in the US illegally would be a good thing, but 53% of Hispanics uh, support this. Um, you know, a figure that I think would probably generally astonish a lot of Democratic Party activists. It does force a question, though, right, which is that I agree precisely with the characterization that, you know, there's people who think there's no center. There's people who think that every moderate voter is just, you know, either a left-wing extremist or a right-wing extremist that's confused or has some combination of left-wing extremist views, and there's just no way of finding them at all. I think that's wrong. There is a kind of voter who thinks that all these centrist voters, you know, would love to vote for Mike Bloomberg. Right. They would love to have somebody who's a kind of broadly socially progressive big city mayor and entrepreneur, but, but who really believes in low taxes and letting businesses thrive. And there's just very little evidence that that is where the center of public opinion is. The center of public opinion seems to be pro-capitalism, but actually wanting to take on health insurance costs and uh, involve the, the welfare state in, in, in making sure that people have decent lives in a more robust way than today and so on. Sort of mildly economically populist without being anti-capitalist on, on economic questions. And then probably, I agree with you somewhat center or center right from perspective of the Democratic Party on cultural issues. Now, when you say this to rooms full of Democrats, and I have been in rooms with each of you where I've actually seen this play out, and I uh, see it in many other contexts as well, the immediate response from Democrats is, well, you're telling us to sell these people out, right? You're telling us that we should sell immigrants down the river, we should sell trans people down the river, that you know, winning elections should be more important uh, to us than serving the interests of those groups, and perhaps we're just not willing to do that. Is there a middle path here? What does your survey say about whether you can actually stand for what are some of the core small-D democratic values, but also some of the core capital-D democratic values of cultural inclusion, of living up 
to the basic promise of equal treatment in our country while moving firmly into the societal center on those cultural issues. Is that mutually exclusive or is there a clear path for uh, seizing this opportunity from the perspective of Democrats without abandoning the ideals in that way? Well, there are two things to say about that. Well, more than two, but I'll say these two. The best way to actually serve the interests of various constituencies that support your party is to have a broad enough coalition to actually be able to stably enact your program and help you know, those and other people. You need the broad coalition to have a stable, effective approach to governance that's going to benefit these people, be they black people, be they recent immigrants, or, and so on. And the second thing, and this you were alluding to this, Yasha, is you know, who is throwing who under the bus? And what, what is the evidence that, for example, black people want less policing? There's no evidence. They, they want more and better policing. What's the evidence that, you know, you alluded to this too, Im recent immigrants in this country want a sort of a relatively open border and a, as opposed to an orderly immigration system? Who is throwing who under the bus? The problem, a lot of the things that people like us perhaps are accused of wanting to throw people under the bus about are not the priorities of the constituencies that are in question here, working class people, black people, Hispanic people. They're the priorities of the groups who purport to represent them and who threaten to mobilize against the party in question if they don't follow their dictates. And, you know, they're really their paper tigers, a lot of these groups. They don't have that much support. They don't have the ability to massively mobilize against a compromise on a lot of these issues. But they say they do. And that just gets back to another point we were raising earlier about you know, sort of people who believe we live in this polarized universe where it's all just about mobilizing the hardest core supporters of each parties. And that's how these activist groups can get away with threatening to mobilize their most hardcore supporters against the party and undermining its prospects and so on. It's all it's all bullshit, basically. <laughs> they don't have the power. They don't have the support. Uh, and in fact, like what most the median black person wants or the median Hispanic person wants is quite different than what you know these groups say they do. So they want, for example, you know, there was never any support to go back to what I was just mentioning. The idea that, you know, we should defund the police was always really unpopular. You know, nobody wanted that, including people who lived in poor black communities. It was clear that they wanted safe streets. It was clear they wanted more and better policing that was documented over and over again. But somehow we talked for months about how, you know, the greatest scourge in this country is you know, the, the sort of police brutality and why even bother to, to have them, you know, if they're so bad. And that's just did not have a base in, you know, and, and this is, again, this is something covered in our survey where you see like two thirds majorities and more saying, you know, we don't want to move money out of police budgets. We want to basically our priority should be to fund the police and basically do something about crime. You can see this in so many issues. What would appear to be a common sense position that for example, the left in this case might accuse you of throwing people under the bus is actually what people believe. <laughs> the actual people you're purporting to want to help. This is what they believe. This is their priority. Their priorities are not your priorities. And the inability of democratic elites to stand up to this nonsense is part of the Democrats' problem and why they can't move toward this kind of purposive coalition building we're talking about. Yuval, Rui has been very clear on what the problem of the Democrats is. By the same token, why is it that the Republicans have not yet succeeded in building what some of the intellectual leaders of the party, such as they are, have talked about for about a decade now, which is to build a genuinely multiracial working class coalition. They've clearly moved somewhat in that direction. They have expanded their share of the vote among particularly working class non-white voters, Latinos, but also with some of the polls at the moment are to be believed um, African Americans. But they haven't gone nearly far enough in that direction to command a clear majority in the way that parties at times have in the past. You know, what is it that has inhibited Republicans from seizing this opportunity more decisively? And what would they have to do in order to do so in the coming uh, years, if not in the few weeks remaining of a campaign? I do think there's a way that the situation of Republicans is better, broadly speaking, than of the Democrats, but that the leaders they've chosen, especially the leader they've chosen over the last 10 years, has made it difficult for them to seize the opportunity they have. Republicans have been moving in the direction of the middle I described, which is more, more economically populist than they used to be. 
um, and reasonably socially conservative. That's the direction the party's moving in. So in a sense, its momentum is pushing it in the correct direction, which is not the case most of the time for the Democrats. But they're doing it in a way that is very off-putting to voters that they have to keep. Um, they are gaining new voters. Republicans have gained new voters, and they're very proud of that, and they'll point you to it. And and it looks like Donald Trump could win 15% of the black vote. And if you had told Mitt Romney you could win 15% of the black vote, he would say, great, we're going to win 60% of the vote. But in the in the process of doing that, Republicans have lost a lot of the voters that even Mitt Romney just a decade ago was able to count on almost without thinking about it. And those tend to be suburban, middle-class, college-educated voters who were comfortable with Republicans as a party of stability, as a party that had the, the, the that had in mind a basically functional economy and could be counted on to make that work. It's harder for them now to persuade people that that's who they are. And some of the problems they face on that front are similar to those of the Democrats. I think that the survey that we uh, base our paper on points in this direction, even on abortion, for example, where Republicans face an enormous challenge with public opinion. But it turns out that the position of the Democrats is actually quite unpopular. The position that there should be essentially no limits on abortion throughout pregnancy isn't really what Americans think. But Americans believe Republicans want to ban all abortion at all times. And Republicans have trouble persuading them that isn't the case because their own activists on that issue won't let them say so. And so again, there is this some of this kind of dynamic of we can't say what voters need us to say so that they can be comfortable allowing our coalition to achieve anything. But there is also just a sense, of, uh, an underlying sense that the populist party can't be trusted. That's always a problem that the populist party in American politics faces. That, that has been the Democrats at some, at some points in the past. It is now the Republicans. And that means that in order to make the most of their working class voters, they have to be more trustworthy, more reliable, more normal. Again, as uh, Rui used that word with the Democrats too, they just have to strike voters as normal. And they certainly have not done that in the Trump era and so voters see a huge risk in supporting Republicans right now. And as long as that's the case, they can't capitalize on what I do think is a real opportunity for them going forward, but an opportunity they're going to have to capitalize on in a different way than they have been in the Trump era. Yeah, I mean, that's a very important point. And I think one uh, concrete way to, to, to think about this is, you know, obviously the Republicans have been shedding white college graduate voters, right? I mean, that's well established, you know, particularly in the suburbs. But who are these people? All right. A lot of these people who have moved over to the Republicans are not particularly liberal. They're moderate to conservative. And if you look at the moderate to conservative white college graduates in our survey and in others, it's very clear that their their positions are, are actually not very consistent with the sort of center of gravity of where the Democratic Party is coming from at this point. They're energy realists, they're moderates on immigration, they're moderates on crime, they're not really enamored of, of racial and gender ideology, but they vote for the Democrats nonetheless because they hate Trump and they think, again, he's an irresponsible populist. So you, you sand off the rough edges on that or just get someone else in there who can appeal to moderate to conservative white college graduates and all of a sudden you've got the makings of a of a solid majority if you keep your, your burgeoning working class base. But it's really hard to do that when your standard bearer is someone like Trump and there are elements of the party who are, you know, sort of not only bonkers, but actually pretty influential. <laughs> Yeah, I think Republicans have avoided this in part by persuading themselves that there aren't many Republicans who are anti-Trump. Because if you look at the Republican primary voters, the anti-Trump vote is in the neighborhood of 15%. But if you look at potential Republican voters, the anti-Trump vote is massive and determinative in election after election. The fact is Trump has been an enormous cost to the Republican Party, a huge electoral burden and a lot of people in the party, voters and politicians and activists, still to this day do not see it that way. So you're saying that the basic dynamic of American politics is that you should expect a dominant 
coalition to come into being at some time, that there is at least the potential through agency for one of the two political parties to actually seize the moment and build that kind of dominant coalition. I think part of the hope behind this is that this kind of dominant coalition would make our politics a lot more sane, that it would force the other party back to the negotiating table in order to compete with the out party, that at the moment each party can be indulgent to its own activists precisely because the other one is also indulgent to its activists. So that would be a broader salutary effect for this political system if one of these parties uh, figures this out. So with few weeks left of the 2024 election, I think it's quite obvious that whoever wins, and even if a win in the end is a little bit less tight than it looks according to polls at the moment, it's not going to be that kind of transformative election. When will it happen? I mean, how confident are you that this is going to happen in 2028 or 2032? Are you talking about a theoretical possibility that people should be aware of and politicians might try to seize, but that is really uncertain? Or do you think in, in 10 years, in 12 years, we likely will be talking about the a nascent dominant coalition that one political party has been able to build? Well, I think we should expect it to happen, yes, but I think part of what will be involved in it is a kind of generational transition in American politics that is only beginning. I'm not sure that this is uh, happening in over the next election cycle, um, but I do think that we're living in a period where both parties are failing in a fundamental way to do their job and the missing ingredient is they're seeing it and seeing the opportunity. The fact of voter dissatisfaction, which is very great now, should be uh, an increasingly strong force that wakes up the parties to the potential opportunity here. It is going to take political talent. I mean, it's going to take somebody who understands coalition building as their purpose and also knows what they sound like to people who don't agree with them. And that's a kind of knack that we've oddly lost in American politics. If you think about the people who have been transformative in relatively modern times, they've been someone who was a liberal in Arkansas his whole life. They've been someone who was a Republican in Hollywood his whole life. People who are really used to the notion that, you know what, not everybody begins by assuming what I assume. And both parties now are kind of full of people who are not very good at that. Um, I, I do think that that sort of talent would present somebody with a pretty extraordinary opportunity at the moment, and it's not just going to sit there on the table forever. Yeah, I mean, political entrepreneurship takes political entrepreneurs, and it's, you know we can't really tell at this point where that's going to come from, but right now, they're clearly not who's, who's dominating running the parties. I mean, Trump is Trump. He's got a shtick. He's going to stick with it. Kamala Harris, I think, is, is like a placeholder for the you know, current Brahmin left edition of, of the Democratic Party. I mean, she's not an entrepreneur who's going to do anything particularly different in terms of expanding the coalition. She's just trying to get by. Um, and she's a product of California liberal democratic politics, which, not to be unkind to California liberal democratic politics, is not that close to the center of the country. But that's what she's used to and that's what she's comfortable with. So, but out there in the governors and the senators, maybe below that level, you know, it seems like that would be a logical thing for some, you know, smart, talented man or woman to start thinking about. This is not working what we're doing. We're not maximizing you know, our probabilities here of, of building a coalition. We're, we're just getting by. We're, we're at a stalemate. We need to break that stalemate. And I'm the person who's going to do it. So, you know, where who it is and where they are, I don't know. But I do think the possibilities there. And I do think eventually it'll be taken advantage of. And you can certainly make the argument that in the aftermath of this election, you know, there should be a lot of raw material for people to be rethinking uh, their approach in the rest of the 2020s. And the 2028 could conceivably loom as a very important election where uh, some of that entrepreneurial coalition building might might actually come to pass, but we'll see. So, you know, never make predictions about the future. That's what I say. But I think it cannot be ruled out that this might come sooner than we think. Yuval and Roy, thank you so much for this great report and thank you for spending this time with us today. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod 
at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.